front of you like this. Just do it. Look at your hand. Okay, so you can't feel it and you can't see it, but right now, about every second, there's a particle going through your hand. That particle is called a muon, and it's born in the top of the atmosphere of the Earth, where high energy particles, which have been accelerated in the universe, hit the top of the Earth, and they, it's like in a particle accelerator, like at the LHC where the Higgs was made. It makes a big explosion, a whole bunch of particles come out. Some of the particles that have come out are called muons. It's like a heavy version of an electron, the same thing that goes around in wires. And it gets born there, and probably it should die, and it should fall apart before it ever gets to the Earth. But because it's going almost at the speed of light, it actually lives long enough to hit your hand, because the time, its internal clock gets slowed down. Okay, you should still have your hands out until you put your hands back yet. Okay, now turn your hands over and look at your thumbnail. So every second, about a trillion particles called neutrinos are going through your thumbnail. Those particles are coming from the inside of the sun, the nuclear fusion that's causing the sun to run. These particles, neutrinos, are extremely hard to measure. They hardly interact at all. Sometimes they're called ghostly particles. You can put your hand up. <laughs> In fact, in your whole life, the chances of one of those neutrinos actually bumping into something in your body and making some effect is only 25%. Even though there's only a trillion going, going through your thumbnail every second. They're really, really weak. So the only way to measure a neutrino is to get something that's really, really, really heavy. So I work on a set of experiments that are underneath a mountain, a kilometer underground in Japan. It's called Super Kamiokanda. You can look on your phone later. It's a really cool looking picture. It's got 50,000 tons of water in it. It's really, really heavy. So how is it, because we're here to talk about astronomy and about LSFT, which is on the top of a mountain, how is it that I came to work underground, where it's dark, to work on the top of the mountain, as far away from the bottom of the mountain as you can? So I want to tell you about that today. And I'm going to start by telling you a story about a time when I was a graduate student, a long time ago, when I was still fresh-faced, like a graduate student's here. <laughs> okay, I worked on another underground experiment in Italy, uh, in a place called the Gran Sasso. So I've been underground in Japan, and I've been underground in Italy. The coffee is better underground in Italy. <laughs> and it's near a town called L'Aquila, which is a very beautiful town. And some of you might have heard about it, because unfortunately a few years ago there was a big earthquake there. Um, but it's located in the Apennines. So if you're in Rome and you drive for about an hour and a half, and you start heading towards the Adriatic Sea, you'll pass through the Apennines. And when you get to the highest mountain in the Apennines, a place called the Gran Sassa, which means big rock in Italian, there's a traffic tunnel. And the traffic tunnel goes underneath. And there's a lab there, and that's where I worked. Okay, I work on measuring these particles like, called like neutrinos, right? And so why do you go underneath a mountain to measure a particle like that? Well, those muons that were going through your hand in the beginning, that's a problem, because it's really hard to measure neutrinos. You don't get to measure them very easily, and those muons can mess up the measurement. So if you go underneath a mountain, it's like a filter. It stops all those muons from going through. Imagine taking a baseball and throwing it at a pile of sand. The baseball will slow down until it gets to the center of the, of the sand. And so if you were at the very center of that sand, you could look in a very quiet environment. So that's why we go underground. So when I was living in this town in L'Aquila, it's a very beautiful town, and it's famous actually for something people in Italy would know about, and that's uh, something called the pardoning. And every year, around this time of the year, there's a, a big festival that's there. And it's because, this is the going back in history part, in the, of the year 1200 or so, okay, so if any of you are screenwriters, take out your pencil. This would make an awesome movie. I don't know why anybody has, ever, has never done this before. There was a guy, his name was Peter of Moroni, Pietro di Moroni. And he was a, basically a, a hermit, a monk. He was a very serious guy, and he lived in a cave. He was a very religious person. And he lived there, and he wanted to lead a very, very simple life. He was a Benedictine monk. And he eventually, many people started to gather around him. He was a very holy person. And he founded sort of a monastery. Now, at that time, the previous pope in Rome had died, and they were sort of competing or talking about who should be the pope, and it was two years. They hadn't been able to, to do the pope, and to choose the next pope. And so this goes to show that even then, if you're in a meeting, you, know, you shouldn't make a comment unless you want to take care of it. Pietro wrote a letter to the cardinals in Rome, and he said, you guys have to choose a pope, or you're going to be in big trouble, right? You need to do this. And so somebody who was there said, I nominate Pietro di Moroni. <laughs> awesome. So they wrote him a letter, and he basically said, absolutely not. I don't want to be Pope. You know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm an aesthetic. You know, I, I, I really like a simple life. And they were very serious. And the king of Naples and all sorts of people came back, and they convinced him to be Pope. Okay? He was only Pope for about five months. And you might have actually heard his name recently, because he became Pope Celeste V. 
And the thing that he's most famous for is he wrote, before he resigned, something which said a living pope could step down, because he didn't want to do it anymore. He, he, didn't, he really didn't like it very much. He had no administrative experience. And the next person to step down from being pope was Pope Benedict, just a few years ago, right? And so that's why you might have heard his name. So that's what most people know him for, okay? So he stepped down from being pope, and then he was sort of kept in a castle. He wasn't exactly in prison, but he wasn't allowed to go around wherever he wanted by the next pope, and eventually, eventually he died. But the thing that he's really famous for in L'Aquila, and the reason I know about him, is he was actually made pope in L'Aquila, because the place he lived was near there. And there's a very beautiful church called uh, Colomaggio, San Maria de Colomaggio, and that's where he was made pope, and he's, he was buried there later. And what he did soon after he became pope was that he did something that was very special, especially for the normal people. So at that time, um, you know, you could get an indulgence to be, to be basically pardoned of your sins, okay? But sometimes there was money involved and there was a lot of stuff to do, so rich people were able to get this pretty easily. But sometimes for more people, it wasn't so easy. And soon after he became pope in this church, he said every year around August 28th, so coming up, there's a special door that's going to be opened in this church. And if you open the door on this special day, if you walk through that door, you'll be pardoned of all your sins. doesn't matter who you are. If you're poor, if you're rich, no, mo no money involved, you can be pardoned of your sins. And they've still done this, this festival for 720 years. So that's how, as a student, I once wound up with my friend, who was another graduate student, hanging by a tree on the side of a mountain with a bunch of nuns watching a parade of people who had come from all over Italy wearing traditional clothing. It was really amazing to, to take part in this ceremony. Now, at the end of the ceremony, you can walk through the door, right, to be pardoned of all your sins. And I wasn't very comfortable with this idea because I'm not Catholic. I didn't know if it was really appropriate. But my friend who is Catholic, who I was with, with other students, said, we, we have to do this. It's definitely awesome. So I didn't point out this to you, but it was a pretty nice day that day. I just remember it was a very beautiful skies, and it was sort of hot. It was really an amazing experience. So I agree with Stefan, my friend, that we're going to go through this door. And as we start to get near the door, this giant gust of wind comes, and it starts blowing the door closed. So we jump through the door as the door is sort of closing behind us. And I, you know, I didn't think that much of it. It was a little weird. But we uh, went, went into the door. And then we were in the church. And there's some things that you should do in the church to really do this. You should take confession and things, which of course I didn't do. And, and, but we looked in the church. We were in the church for quite a long time. I'd been in the church before, but never in this sort of really special environment. There was a lot of amazing stuff around. And so at the end, you, you go out through the main door, the normal door in the front. Remember, it was a nice day. So we go to the front of the door, and I open the door, and I look outside. It is the most horrific storm I've ever seen in my entire life. There was lightning and wind and giant trees.